being at USC, uh, John Singleton being at USC. Uh, what did you guys, were you there at the same time? Did you overlap? Did you know each other? How did that work? Uh, we were there at the same time. I was a grade or a stand, a grade standing uh, ahead of John. So um, they used to have a African-American project or a black project. It was called the Black Student Union. Um, and what they would do every year, they would put on a production called An Evening of Soul. Anything that had acting involved, I wanted to know, like, what do I audition? I want to know if I'm good enough to, to, you know, compete or get the role. So I went in and audition and I got the role. I played like a king. Um, and I remember uh, having lines and doing the production. Uh, the football team was part of the production. Uh, it was it was a big deal at USC, um, especially the fact that we didn't have a lot of African-American students during that time. But we had enough to put on the production. Um, and John saw me perform. And he was like, the king, that dude, I see him on campus. He's always smiling. He's like, um, I'm, I'm going to meet that guy. So a mutual friend, she introduced us after the, the, the play. And he said, hey, man, you're good. And he said, I always see you on campus, you know, like in a, in a hurry. I'm like, yeah, I'm always trying to get to class, man. If you're on time, you're late. And he laughed. He said, I like that. I like that. And he said, one day we got to work together. So moving forward, um, I ended up graduating my senior year. Uh, John was a junior and he became a senior. And he got my phone number. John was that type of person. If he wanted to connect with you, he's going to find a way to connect with you. And he got uh, my number and he called and said, hey, man, how's life after SC? And I said, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm uh, and I just did my first commercial. I'm, I'm you know, really trying to uh, get a little legs under me in this in this Hollywood thing. He said, well, hey, I got a final exam. Yeah, it's a project called Boys in the Hood. He's like, it's something I kind of been working on. He's like, um, but I need a strong actor. He said, you think you could come to SC and read it for me? And I said, yeah, I'll be glad to do it. Um, again, anytime there's like a play or anything that's going to allow me to hone my craft, I was in. So I drove over to SC. He gave me the script. Um, at that time, I didn't know what the script would become. It just looked like a, a script that a student wrote. But then I started looking at the material because the, the type of actor I am, uh, I'm a student of the game. I respect uh, Oscar Mishaw, uh, obviously, uh, uh, you know, James O. Jones, Sidney Porche uh, of this era, Denzel Washington. They're all students of the game as well. That means get a script, look at it and decide, OK, what direction do I want to take this character? Where is this character been and where are they going? So that was my choice. And in reading his script, I was like, this is incredible. Like, man, I wonder what he's planning on doing with this. Still clueless, Soren, clueless. So at about the 15 minute mark, he said, hey, have you looked it over enough? And I said, hey, let's get it. And we went in and read. I, I actually read the character uh, of Doughboy when he's talking to Trey about his brother being killed and Nowhere are they talking about him on the news. And he even says either they don't know, don't show or don't care about what's going on in the hood. It, it made me tear up because I felt that same way growing up in the hood. You know, do they they don't know, show or even care about what's going on in the hood. So when I did the lines, it was easy to do. Them. It was well written. Um, but I didn't let the character cry. I let my eyes well up with tears, but I didn't let them drop. And the whole class was crying when I read the project for John. Um, and he got an A on the project, by the way. Um, but um, it was important for me not to cry because Doughboy was too hard to cry. We got this false narrative that tough guys don't cry. And so I'm looking at the, the character and I'm like, yeah, he's going to hold back. There's too many other homies watching him. So I'll wild up with tears, but I'm not going to let them drop. And um, the class shared that actually that hit me harder than if you cried because we could tell you wanted to cry but there would be ramifications if you did and we like that you know thank you for that and john was just smiling man so here i am walking off and he's like thank you i appreciate it you know you really you really took care of that he said when i come up you're gonna come up so in my head i'm thinking yeah you know i believe him i think he, you know we'll work together one day but i'm thinking 10 15 years down the line Man, he called me in like four months. 
because right. I un unbeknownst to me, he already had a three picture deal to Columbia Studios and he kept me in mind. Um, he personally called um, and said, hey, you might want to come and read for this project. Now, he's still not telling me it's his project. Um, and that was actually how I got the edition. Um, he invited me to come to Columbia Studios and read for Boys in the Hood. I'm thinking he's a PA or an assistant, not knowing he's a director. Um, and I went in and read. Um, and so I know it's a long story, but man, I remember it like yesterday uh, actually changed my life. And did, did he have you read for Monster right off? He had me read for Monster. And again, they had me read for the character of Doughboy because at that time, they didn't know if Cube was going to be on tour and unable to do the film. So they say read for this too. Um, and I think John might have told him, hey, he hammered this in uh, my finals. Um, and so I read from, for uh, Monster, I read for Doughboy. Um, unbeknownst to me, uh, John was behind the, there's a producer's window is what I call it, where the producers and the director sit behind a two-way mirror. They can see you, but you can't see them. John was back there. Uh, so when I went into the edition, he's back there with the producers and I'm reading unbeknownst to me. Um, and um, I read for the part uh, of, of, of uh, Monster. And as I was leaving, going to my car, I can hear you, Baldwin, Baldwin, he's calling me. And I said, oh, that's John. I was like, hey, man, I was looking for you. Still not knowing what his role was. And John preferred it that way. He was he was a funny guy like that. And the joke was on me. Uh, in a good way. And he said, how do you think you did? I said, hey, man, I went in and, you know, I was 10 toes down. That's a, a, a saying that I get from my parents. I was 10 toes down. I put my best uh, effort in. And he's like, so how do you think you did? I said, well, I'd like to see the actor to get the role if I don't, because I really went all in. And he laughed. Well, good luck, man. And so on. I'm still not knowing what this man's role is with this film. So he, all right, good luck. He gave me the, you know, the, the, the handshake and the shoulder and chest bump. And uh, I went on about my way, not knowing that he already had a three picture deal. Already knew that he wanted me for the role, but he needed the producers and director to, or not the director, he was the director, but the producers to see uh, this is who I like and this is why I like him. Um, and I was blessed with that role. It was my first uh, major film uh, role um, and uh, changed my life. Yeah, it's definitely a major film for sure. <laughs> Last, yeah. So, so that being said, one of the things that I always enjoyed about Boys in the Hood, and you read it long before it was started filming, was like at the uh, scene at the barbecue when everybody's playing dominoes and then spades and the discussion about AIDS. And the thing that I thought Boys in the Hood did a good job of throughout the film was injecting a lot of the social commentary and the political awareness in mm -hmm. the midst of this backdrop of South Central living. Mm -hmm. So for you as a, as an actor, as a student, as somebody that grew up in this area, when you would, when you were reading it and you saw that those layers to it, how did mm -hmm. that affect you? Oh, I probably cried twice reading it. Remember, I had saw it originally, that part with Doughboy I read for the final. But once I got the full script and started reading the lines, that's one of them. The other one was when they talk about gentrification. Again, having been born and raised in Compton, California, that scene took place in Compton, California. Um, and it hit me. Um, another line that hit me was the, the, the Furious Styles, who was the father of Trey, explaining that anybody can basically make a child, but it takes a real man to be there to raise that child. Those aren't the words he used, but I knew what it meant. Those things just hit me in the face. Like, man, this is great. Like he wrote a heck of a script. Um, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty because we didn't know how the film would do. There weren't a lot of inner city films at the time that would make those type of statements and be, uh, blessed enough to be nominated for two Oscars. So we were like, okay, let's just do the best that we can with this film. Uh, the uncertainty was, well, who's going to see it? You know, we were really not sure how that would go, but um, man, there were several scenes uh, in the script that just resonated with me. Uh, the AIDS uh, talk was a big one. Uh, even the, the SAT, because I went through that when he said it's culturally biased. 
um, you know, um, and I was like, wow, that's kind of deep. You know, um, the script just really had a lot of messages in it that resonated. Yeah. And I think, too, it's interesting, you know, when we think back to, I'd say, the three first films the that were real genuine rap films were like the house party new jack city and then boys in the hood mm -hmm. and i think even though house party is a comedy that film is loaded with social commentary mm -hmm. very significant issues and new jack city as well i think yes. boys, boys in the hood gets the most attention but those other two films are heavy mm -hmm. on the messages Mm -hmm. whether, it, whether it's safe sex or it's drug dealing, destroying the community or whatever it is. So that being said, Boys in the Hood gets a lot of acclaim for that. But why do you think that House Party and Boys in the uh, New Jack City don't get as much as Boys in the Hood does? That's a good question. Um, I, I like to think that House Party was looked at by the title party, um, even though there was some some gems and nuggets in there, as you stated. I think people kind of more focused on the party and the hair, you know, always oh, got the high top fade, the clothes, the dances. Um, they did receive the messages in it, but it was more of a party genre. Um, and I don't think anyone was, you know, accustomed yet to getting slammed in the face with some really deep messages. So it was easier to kind of ha ha laugh it off and think about it a little and keep it pushing. Um, New Jack City was more of an East Coast version um, for us on the West Coast. Obviously, on the East Coast, it resonated a little more with them because they, they, you know, were on that side of town. On the on our side of town, um, it was more of, well, I grew up in the hood with Crips and Bloods, like Boys in the Hood. So I think that's why it resonated for sure on the West Coast. Um, and I think the East Coast has always been curious and enamored with the gangster lifestyle of the West Coast. So I think it just hit home for them in that way. Um, and so I think that's why boys um, really is it, kind of like the standard when it comes to the messages, um, you know, and then there was just so much content. You had to focus. If you didn't focus, you might have lost something along the way. Yeah, that's for sure. And in Boys in the Hood, with your portrayal of Monster, when the person from USC comes to recruit him or discuss his potentially attending USC, your, your character monster is like, Hey man, could I get a scholarship too? And then he's like, what do you do? And the best thing, if I remember, like you say is like, Oh, I used to play baseball. So there's no <laughs> academic discussion, even though we're talking about a school, there's no <laughs> football and it's only like something you used to do. And uh -huh. I thought that, not only obviously is extremely well written, but then your your performance and even Cube with Doughboy and the rest of the guys on the porch there, I thought was funny and sad all at the same time. So how, as an actor, and then also growing up in the environment again, how did you balance bringing the humility to the character, but also as somebody who was actually had gone to USC, bringing that ignorance of Monster's perspective to the screen? Another great question. That's all John, may he rest in power and peace. John trusted me as an actor. Um, he, you know, he saw the, the performance when he first met me. Um, he knew about the trophies I would win in speech and stuff. You know, um, it would, they would put it in the Daily Trojan. He knew about me. But I think the final, that reading for his final really made him say, wow, you know, this guy's for real about it. Um, and the fact that I showed up to Columbia and, and, and read pretty strongly, um, he trusted me. And that's what I liked about working with John. He trusted you. If he trusted you and it didn't look the way he wanted, he would give you another example. Oh, well, what about if you do this? He would never say, oh, that wasn't a good choice. He would say, what if you do this? And that was what really was a joy in working with him. For that scene on the porch, that was actually improv. Um, we were both laughing about Mr. Crump coming in and recruiting Ricky and being from USC. And he's like, man, this will be funny because anyone that knows us know we both went to USC. So, hey, man, I need you to, to you know, tell him, hey, hook me up. Where's my scholarship? And so um, that's where the line came from. Yo, man, you think you can hook me up? 
And it also uh, illustrated that even though he might have been a gangster, uh, sometimes you still want to dream. Everybody has dreams. Gangsters are human beings, too. So that was the way I looked at it. Like, OK, hey, man, you know, can I get a scholarship, too? You know, if this guy's coming here to recruit Rick, why not? Why not Monster? You know, and when he said, well, what do you do? Well, I used to play baseball in Monster's world. You know, if you're good in a sport, that's all you needed. He wasn't thinking about the academics, probably didn't care about the academics. Um, but he was dreaming. And I think no matter who you are, we all have dreams. And, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, and so I said, OK, I'm going to keep this guy humble. And kind of naive. He doesn't know that there's a, a classroom aspect. There's an SAT test that he has to take. He has to prepare for and get a certain score to enter that college. Um, you can't you really, for the most part, can't have a criminal record. You shouldn't. So um, there was a lot of elements. But I was like to this guy, this is dreaming. This might be my big break. I might have a chance. And so that was kind of how I played that um, particular um, scene. Um, and I grew up with guys who were great athletes. Some of our best athletes in the community were, were gang members. But what stopped them from going on to greatness was um, not wanting to go to class or, you know, making decisions that weren't the best decisions or the healthiest decisions. Um, and uh, it led to an untimely demise. So you never found out about the guy who could throw the ball 80 yards or run a 4-240 because the hood took them under. And that's the saying that we had back in my era. You know, don't let the hood take you under. Yeah. And and one of the other great scenes that you're in, in Boys in the Hood as Monster, is when you're getting ready to go to the drive-by and you let mm -hmm. your character mm -hmm. lets Cuba out the car. Mm -hmm. And I always, I remember seeing that on, on the screen when it was, when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And I just always remember like, wow, that's uh, great because I fortunately never was in a car where we were about to do a drive by. But I've been in situations where people were like, nah, you can't get out. We're going to ride on this dude. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So do you remember what the conversation was as to why he was allowed to leave the car? Yes. Um, John and myself were the trays in our community. A John ticket out was filmmaking and going to USC. My ticket out was speech debate theater and going to USC. Um, and I had guys that before they did dirt, they would say, hey, the street lights on, homeboy, don't you got to get home? And it would offend me. But underneath, as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, they're protecting me. They see something in me like, OK, he's got some talent. He's got a chance to make it. And so maybe we need to like not you know, expose him. Um, and, and they were proud. Like they, oh man, I heard you did this or you did that. Uh, the big homies, and that's the term that was used, they would be proud of you. Um, and so that was kind of what it was likened to. Um, they knew that Trey's character was not a gang member. Trey's character was hurt by losing his best friend um, to gang violence. Um, and he didn't know which way to respond. And you could see Doughboy's character kind of look at him like, oh, man, you bailing out on me. But you could see it also where he's going, hey, man, what do I expect? This guy not a gangbanger. And then he let him out. Um, and so we did talk about it. Um, and I shared with John, like, man, I used to get passes all the time because I was an athlete or uh, they would call me again a square or a geek because I did plays and speech um you know i had guys that would say man you might not want to roll down there and i'll be like what are they talking about and then boom 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 you hear the shots again they 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 gave you a pass that's the way i looked at it um and john talked about some things where he grew up in south central um where they you know gave him that pass and that's what that was for trey's character you know you're really not about this life i'm surprised you even hear this long let him out. So that's what that was about.
and I want you to listen real close to me. I'm going to ask you some real simple questions, and I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 11.15 because you went to the bookstore buying my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was, I was at the bookstore and at 11.15, and when, when I, bought, I bought the books, I accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At, at 11.15, I was, we, we was, when I was leaving, it was, it was some people coming in, and I, I, I forgot to grab But you, you, you don't remember who what they looked like. What they looked like or nothing, right? No. So, at 12.15, you went to the bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at 12.15, so you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at 12, exactly, at 12.15, at 12 exactly, I was at the bookstore. <laughs> Now you see, you know you're not fucked up. Which, which no, one? First you said you were at the bookstore at 11.15 and then you said you were 12.15. You know you're not fucked up, man. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you, you confusing me, man. So, you get my book, my audio book, 40 years, and Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs>